Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves Once upon a time in Arab, there was a poor woodcutter named Ali Baba who lived in a certain town. He would spend his days cutting firewood in the hills, then loading it onto his donkey to bring back to town and sell. One afternoon, Ali Baba was working hard chopping down a tree on a new hill when he heard the sound of many horses approaching at full speed. They appeared to be headed directly toward him. He quickly climbed up a tall tree to get a better view of what was happening. He saw a group of strong men surrounded by dust. Their faces were dark from the sun, their eyes shone like bright copper, and their beards were shaped like a falcon diving for prey. They were clearly not ordinary travelers. Ali Baba thought to himself, they must be a group of bandits. He tried to conceal himself among the leaves while worrying that his donkey would make noise. The riders dismounted at the bottom of the hill, shouldered heavy-looking bags, and approached a massive rock. The leader, who appeared to be in charge, glared fiercely at all of them. He then turned towards the rock, stood tall and shouted in a loud and rough voice. Open, sesame! And what do you suppose happened? Right in front of him, the sheer face of the rock began to smoothly and silently divide into two until there was an opening a person could pass through. Into this, the robbers disappeared one by one, but soon they re-emerged empty-handed. They'd left their loot inside. Once again the leader turned and gravely commanded, Close, sesame! As if waiting for the sound, the rock entrance began to close up until no sign of it remained. I wonder if I've been dreaming. Or perhaps it was all a mirage. Ali Baba sat there for a long while gathering his wits. Then, making sure that the robbers had all ridden away, he climbed gingerly down from his tree and round to the rock. In a timid, quavering voice he called. Open, sesame! These were indeed magical words. Effortlessly the rock reopened and Ali Baba saw inside a large cavern with a high vaulted roof. Chests of all sizes crammed with gold coins were piled high, intricately worked gold and silver ornaments littered the floor, and the sparkle of many jewels seemed to light up the darkness. Ali Baba sank to his knees, raised his arms, and prayed. I give thee thanks, O creator of heaven and earth, for bestowing on thy servant this treasure the robbers have built up over many years. Afterward, he took just a small part of the hoard, five or six bags of gold, and loaded them onto his donkey. He concealed them amongst the firewood and cautiously went back home. Now Ali Baba's wife was herself the daughter of a woodcutter, and she didn't know what color gold was or what, if anything it smelled like. But when Ali Baba took out a handful to show her, she began to howl like a wild animal. Thief! Villain! Whatever have you done? Haven't you always said it was better for us to starve than to steal from others? They'll hang you now, that's for sure. Calm down, woman! Ali Baba said and told her all that had happened that day. Then, although his wife was still upset, he sent her to his brother Kasim's house nearby to borrow some scales. This Kasim was a real tightwad, and he listened suspiciously when his wife told him of his sister-in-law's request. What, lend him my scales? When he can barely afford feet for his donkey day by day. She says it's just to weigh beans, but I know what we can do and Kasim's wife secretly smeared grease on the bottom of the pans before she took them out to Ali Baba's wife. In this way, they hoped some of whatever had been weighed would be stuck there when the scales were returned. When the pair examined them after they had been brought back, imagine their surprise. Instead of beans, what did they find but a gold piece? Kasim immediately hurried off to his brother's house and began bellowing. You miserable thief! Where did you steal this from? If you don't tell me right away, I'll drag you before the magistrates myself. Quiet down, 
Kasim. I've discovered some magic words that open up a cache of treasure. Here, take half these gold coins. They'll do for now. But where's the rest hidden? And what are the magic words? Kasim couldn't wait but set out for the robber's cave at dawn with a string of ten donkeys. Open, sesame. Wow, look at the gold. And the silks and brocades. But wait. While I'm busy here, somebody might come along and see me. Close, sesame. Good, it's shut again. Wildly Kasim ran around poking into everything and gathering together more than he could possibly take away with him. But when he was ready to leave, suddenly the magic words wouldn't come to him. Open, wheat. No, that's wrong. Open, barley. That's not it either. Open, millet. Damn. Open, peas. Open, rice. He tried other words one after the other as they occurred to him, but the rock wouldn't budge. He had become really frantic when unexpectedly it opened and the band of robbers burst in. KK Kasim's my name. I'm not here to steal any of your hard-won treasure, you know. It's just that I was asked to. Who asked you? My brother, Ali Baba. That's how I know the magic words. That's all we need to hear, and on the spot, they hacked him to pieces. The robber chief then sent two of his men off to town to locate the house of the man Ali Baba. But as it happened, Ali Baba had moved into a new house that very day, so the pair had to wonder about a lot before at last finding it. One of them put a chalk mark on the door, and then they returned to report. Now in Ali Baba's household, there was a young girl named Morgiana who helped him in the kitchen. When she was a small child she had been orphaned, and Ali Baba and his wife had taken her in and adopted her. Not only was she known for her kind-heartedness, but also her keen wit was reflected in her deep and sparkling jet-black eyes. This Morgiana was the one to notice the white mark when she got back from the market. Somehow this seems a bad omen. It's probably the work of some evildoer that wishes us harm, she murmured to herself and set about making exactly the same mark on every other door in the street. That night the whole band of forty robbers swept into the street like a tempest. But since they couldn't find the right house, they swirled around like a black whirlwind before raging back to camp. There the furious chief pitilessly slew with his broad scimitar the pair who had misled them. This time he himself went to locate Ali Baba's house. Then carefully he made his plans. First, he had thirty-eight large earthen jars bought, one of them filled with olive oil. Next, he had his men hide one by one in the other thirty-seven and all of the jars covered with sacking. This was so there would be no danger of their suffocating. Finally, the jars were loaded two at a time onto horses, and with himself posing as an old merchant, the robber chief set out on foot leading the train. As they arrived at the house the sun was setting, and the chief addressed Ali Baba coming from his prayers. Master, I am a stranger in your town with nowhere to stay. I beg lodging of you for the night. Good-heartedly Ali Baba replied, Welcome. Come, lead your horses into the yard, then eat and drink your fill before resting yourself from your journey. When he had been shown in, the long, long Arabian-style feast began. Morgiana meanwhile was busy preparing the food and washing dishes in the kitchen. All at once her lamp started to flicker as the oil in it got low. What'll I do? That's all we had left. Then she remembered that their visitor that night was an oil merchant. Ah, that's right. I'll just borrow a bit from one of his jars and return it tomorrow morning. 
Morgiana took the empty oil jug to the courtyard and was about to uncover one of the large vessels standing there when to her amazement a man spoke from inside it. Chief! Is it time now? The young girl was terrified, but quick-wittedly answered in a deep voice, No, not yet. Fortunately, there was only a thin crescent moon that night. Where the jar stood beside an earthen wall it was pitch black. Stealthily Morgiana went around to each jar and discovered that only one contained any oil, all the others had men hidden inside. After going back to the kitchen and lighting the lamp, she racked her brains thinking about what to do. If I make a fuss, that assassin pretending to be a merchant will escape. Ah, uh, I've got it. Silently she carried all the oil into the kitchen and heated it in a huge cauldron till it boiled. Next, she put some into a bucket, carried it outside, and then one after the other poured the boiling oil into each of the big jars. The thieves were all scalded to death before they could even cry out. Midnight came around, and at an opportune time, the bandit chief left the room and threw some stones out into the yard from a corridor window. But even though he heard them hit against the jars time after time, not one of his men emerged. Thinking it odd he went out to investigate, and was amazed to find all thirty-seven of his men dead. Though he was staggered, he decided there was nothing left now but to take revenge on Ali Baba's family himself, so calmly he went back to the feast. Ali Baba, of course, knew none of all this and continued to shower his guest with hospitality. Presently, a girl dressed in a glittering dancer's costume gracefully made her appearance. She bowed to the guest of honor and began to dance to the beat of a servant's drum. Yes, it was Morgiana. All watched entranced as she danced up to the guest. The drum was beaten even more wildly, and at the height of its fury, Morgiana fixed her pearly black eyes piercingly on the merchant. Then, in a flash, she plunged her dagger up to the hilt into the brigand's sturdy chest. Morgiana, what have you done? Look, father. She ripped off the oil merchant's disguise unmasking the robber and revealed the cutlass hidden in his clothing. Ali Baba took her hands in his and fell to praising her cleverness and courage. From this day on we will think of you as our guardian angel. All the riches in the cave are yours. Although your youth will gradually fade, your wisdom should grow. Then they all sat down again to their own feast of celebrating and rejoicing.